Hi. This is Voltage Research Lab from Pittsburgh Modular. Essentially, it's three Eurorack modules bundled together. The Lifeforms Voltage Lab, the Lifeforms Touch Controller, and a Lifeforms Systems Utilities, all three fit in an angled case with a built-in power supply. More of this track at the end of this video, let's take a closer look. Lifeform's Voltage Lab itself is a collection of modules which can be patched any way you want. You can treat it as a synth voice or as independent sub-modules that can be patched among themselves or with other Eurorack modules. All of these input and output jacks are Eurorack compatible, except one, which is a TRSB type MIDI input. VRL comes with a TRS to 5 pin MIDI adapter and patch cables. I'd recommend getting 90 degree patch cables like these so that patch cables sticking out don't get in the way of the touch controller. Let's start with a general overview. As I mentioned, the voltage lab part of VRL, despite being one physical unit, should be seen as a collection of independent modules, a MIDI arpeggiator module, two oscillators, a complex one, meaning one with quite a few wave shaping options for adding harmonics West Coast style, and a secondary simpler one, with hard sync option and simpler wave shaping. Then moving on to the right, Voltage Lab has two function generators, which is a fancy word for a module that can create a few types of envelopes, LFOs, and act as a slew limiter. Continuing our left to right brief overview tour are two dynamics controllers. These can be either VCAs, filters, or a low pass gate, which is something in between a VCA and a low pass filter. And then finally to the right, it's a single mono analog delay, which goes up to about a third of a second and can be pushed a little bit more. Voltage Lab has a couple more modules that don't have any panel controls, the sample and hold module and the random module. We'll talk about these in a bit. Voltage Lab itself is Eurorack compatible. It can be taken out of the case and put into a Eurorack case. Then on the bottom are two additional Eurorack compatible modules, the touch controller and the systems utilities module. The touch controller has 10 pads. Each can generate gate when it's pressed and three additional control voltages, one for the Y axis and two more per pad based on the position of the knobs. This controller can be treated as a single 10 pad surface or as a split duo combo of five and five pads. It also has a sequencer, more on that later, of course. Finally, on the right is a systems utilities module with line level outputs and a headphone output, as well as an adder and malt. A general rule about the interface, everything is knob per function. The buttons typically have two functions, one labeled right under the button, and then a secondary one in parentheses, which is typically a shift function. Okay, let's dive into the different modules and see what they can do. Let's start with the MIDI ARP module. This is basically a MIDI to CV conversion module. I've got a MIDI keyboard here, so this is what I'll be playing with in demoing this module. To get VRL to make sounds, you do need a minimal bit of patching. I think the, the least is probably just taking the output of one of the oscillators, feeding that into a dynamics controller, and then feeding that into the system's utilities and out to the speakers. The MIDI to CV module generates both CV and gate. Gate can be patched out of this output over here and CV is routed internally to the oscillators. The end result, as I mentioned before, is that you can play notes on an external MIDI keyboard into VRL. Notice that the module buttons have MIDI under them in parentheses. This means that I can connect the gate internally to trigger them by holding this button. This is sort of like the MIDI shift button. And uh, let's say if I wanted to trigger the dynamics controller, right, which I can right now. You can see the MIDI is on. If I hit shift and mode, it'll turn MIDI off. Then if I play the keyboard, nothing will happen. This is what makes an internal connection, say from here to here. I can also connect the envelopes or the function generators as well. So let's hook these up too to MIDI and I'll turn cycling off for this one. You can see that both are now triggered when I press the keyboard. So these internal connections come in handy. I'll disconnect these guys for now. The MIDI module also sends out clock to the system, which you can either tap tempo or receive from MIDI coming in or through this input. Voltage Lab has a built-in arpeggiator. I'll hold a chord on the keyboard. 
which obviously is monophonic, so it can't play as a chord, but if I hit the arpeggiator, right, that will cycle based on the clock, which I can make faster or slower. There's a hold function as well, and you can also add octaves to the arpeggiated pattern. The MIDI ARP module has a ARP mode that's really like a sequencer. If you hold this MIDI shift button and play a pattern on your keyboard, I keep adding notes and it'll play the pattern back. You could also add rests to it by pressing this button while holding this MIDI shift. So let's say I want to play Do, Re, Mi, and rest, and Fa, and Sol. Right? You can add rests this way as well. You can also randomize a pattern. So if I, let's say, hold this basic pattern, right, then hold MIDI and random. You can see that written here, hopefully. Right, randomize the pattern. Let's do it again. Well, it's back to normal, but okay, another random version of it. And then finally, if you can't be bothered to come up with your own patterns, just press the shift button, again, this fourth MIDI button, and hold and it'll generate a random pattern for you with between 1 to 16 notes. Let's do that again. Sound is a bit clicky because of the gate triggering it. We'll smoothen it out with the function generators in a bit. All right, so if you need something to get you going, that's one way of doing it. Okay, let's move on from MIDI ARP and take a look at the head honcho in one of the main events in VRL, the primary oscillator. This oscillator takes basic waveforms we're used to seeing in synths and shapes them in different ways, both subtle and non-subtle, which can have a big impact on what happens to them once they reach the wave folder or timbre control. You page through the different waveforms by pressing this button and every core waveform also has a warp mode. We'll get to why in a bit. Right, so you can cycle through the different waveforms or combination of waveforms this way. Now just to make sure you're hearing and seeing the core waveforms, let's just hook them up directly to the input, not go through the dynamics processor. Right? So this is the sine wave and this is the warped sine wave. Very simple. And triangle. Right? And the warped version. Sawtooth. And the warp version in square. No pulse width modulation, by the way, but a lot of other wave shaping options. And the warp version, then a few combo options sine and saw, warped, triangle and square, and warped. And back to the basic sine wave shape. So what's this warp business? Well, basically the timbre control, right, is the wave folder. This is sort of like the West Coast version of adding harmonics rather than removing them with a filter. And this works really nicely on sine or triangle waveforms. And really sounds good, but on saw or square waveforms, it kind of does this, which is sort of just go up and down and level. Same for square. Right? Not much impact, certainly not as cool as what was going on with the sine and triangle waves. So what warp does, if you take a look at the harmonics, is not change them much, but if you take a look at the waveform, now it's something that can be folded, right? And then folding this, Sounds much better than just folding a raw square wave. Let's take a look at the saw. Right? Folded without warp. Still okay, right? And let's look at the before and after without warp. With a little bit duller, but still similar. And then as we turn up the timbre. It gets some of that uh, wave-folded magic as well. 
So warp together with timbre makes the biggest difference. The asymmetry and access controls are a little bit more subtle. Let's take a look at them, for example, on a sine wave. All right, so the asymmetry will sort of straighten out half of the waveform, as you can see here. And axis kind of like makes it a little bit uh, thinner, right? And a little bit different. Let's take a look, say, at axis on a sawtooth. Right? Then asymmetry on a sawtooth. Okay, so it's much more subtle when you don't have the wave folder active, but when you do, right, then it kicks in in a more material way. See? Of course, with warp. Now, these sound nice as is, but with reverb, things can get really cool. Aside from those, the primary oscillator has a few cross mod options. Before we get into that, let's take a look at the secondary oscillator because we need that for the cross mods. The secondary oscillator is simpler, as I mentioned before. It has three modes, either sine, which is simple, alpha, which is a triangle that gets wave shaped and pushed into a sort of square, like a distorted square which is pretty cool, and a combination of sine and alpha. Right. Also nice and deep. The secondary oscillator also has hard sync for hard sync to work well. Its frequency needs to be higher than the core oscillator. Right, so this is without hard sync and then with hard sync becomes slaved to the frequency of the primary oscillator and the hard sync effect is something that you get when you change its frequency. Let's try the hard sync just on the sine wave. Then on the alpha wave. Okay, cool stuff. And like I mentioned before, the secondary oscillator can be used to modulate the primary oscillator or anything else, of course. Now you could do this with patch cables, but there's an existing connection from the secondary oscillator to the primary one, which lets you also select modulation destinations. And you can modulate anything from FM, the frequency of oscillator one. Right, for that, we need to listen to oscillator one. There's a mod depth. Right, so it can be anything from very subtle vibrato. Wait, hang on. Okay, maybe this is better suited for more extreme modulation. Right, FM. You can modulate the waveform, right? If you liked, you can higher low rates. And there's also amplitude or AM, right? And ring mod. Right? More metallic, retains less of the original pitch of the primary oscillator. And just when you think things couldn't get crazier, you could also have both FM and waveform modulation, FM and amplitude modulation, and FM and ring mod. And, yeah, it gets even more interesting if you hard sync oscillator too. Right, this can get pretty crazy. Yeah, so there are quite a few things to explore in the oscillator section. By the way, you don't have to use the secondary oscillator to modulate the modulation destination. There's also a mod CV input over here with the trimmer control right here. Okay, let's take a look at the function generators. Like I mentioned before, these could be envelopes, LFOs, slew rate limiters, clock dividers, a whole bunch of things. 
up until now I've been using gate from the MIDI controller to control the dynamics, which basically was a gate on and off. Let's disconnect that and hook up into, let's say this envelope. So now I'm gonna want this to control my dynamics, right? So let's plug that into here. When in trigger mode, this is a basic attack decay or rise fall envelope, right? So I could have a slow attack or a slow rise in this case in level and a sharp fall or a slow rise and a slow fall, right? Or vice versa. And it also has a sustain mode, right? Where as long as I hold the key, the note will be held. When I leave it, the fall event happens. So this is a simple ASR envelope, right? I hold the key, level goes up. I leave it, level goes down. The last function generator mode is cycle, as you heard before, right? I can use this to generate basically an LFO with a slow attack and a sharp fall. It's kind of like a side chain effect. The other way around is a sawtooth LFO. And then I can shape it into a triangle LFO or just a fast audio rate LFO. This goes up to about 75 hertz, I think. Right, so not into high audio rates, but the option is still there if you want it. Regardless of the mode you're in, you also have response control, right, anywhere from logarithmic to exponential, right? So the motion is either like this, up and down, or dome-shaped, which is longer typically, right? So if you want to get into audio rates, make sure the response is turned all the way counterclockwise. Both function generators are identical, except that this one has a end of rise output and this one has an end of fall output. The function generators can be linked so that B triggers based on various stages in function generator A. So by default, when I trigger A, B won't do anything. If I click the unison mode button and turn on zero degrees, they'll both be triggered at the same time. At 90 degrees, function generator B will be triggered at the end of the rise stage of function generator A. Right? And then at 180 degrees, it'll be triggered at the end of the fall. You also have a few combination options, right? So there's a lot to play with on the function generator side as well. By the way, the patch bay also gives you access to the higher of the two functions with the OR output or the difference between them with the contrast output. All right, let's continue our tour on to the dynamics controllers. These have three core modes. They can either be a VCA, a filter, or a combination of VCA and filter, which is called a low pass gate. So in VCA mode, the dynamics controller is pretty simple. It just increases the level of all the harmonics equally or decreases them. Filter mode is a low pass filter, 12 dB per octave or two pole filter, right? It filters out frequencies above the cutoff point at a rate of 12 dB per octave and it also has resonance. Resonance doesn't self-oscillate, right? but it has nice grit when it's there. Okay, so that's filter mode. And low pass gate mode is something in between the two. Right, so it both increases level and subtly adds harmonics and resonance works here as well right, to a lesser degree, but it's there. Now the filter and the low pass gate also have a response parameter, which is sort of like how quickly it changes or a slew on changes. This emulates different types of vectorals that were in the original Buchla models that this is inspired by. So just for fun, let's use noise to demonstrate this. So notice when I close and open the dynamics using the keyboard, which you can't see here, right? The response is very quick. 
right, the filter closes rather quickly. But if I turn up response, right, it takes it longer. This is even more noticeable with resonance. Right, this is a slow response to close the filter and faster response all the way to what you typically expect from a filter, though even this has this sort of little envelope. Same applies to the low pass gate, by the way. All right, let's take down resonance. Right. You can almost hear sort of like an echo on the noise and we're not going through the delay circuit and there's no reverb applied to this. Right? So that's the response parameter. And just for fun, the low pass gate and the filter have a pluck parameter, which you can turn on or off, right? Both for the low pass gate and for the filter. This adds a little extra pluck, right? Or a little extra laser beam to the motion of the, the cutoff or the resonance, right? It adds both of them. So let's check it out. The filter without. And with pluck, just a little bit more. Pluck completely bypasses the dynamic CV input. So if I turn this down all the way, right, down to here, all the way to the bottom, right? So now we shouldn't be hearing anything, right? As I hit the keys and you have to believe me, I'm hitting them. But if we turn on pluck, right, you get this little, again, little laser beam extra, both for the filter and for the low pass gate, again, without pluck and with pluck. Right? This changes based on the response as well. So pluck is that little extra accent you can give the dynamics. Okay, that's enough with the noise. Let's go back to the oscillator and move on to the delay. And for that, I need to patch it into the signal chain, right? So into delay in and then from delay out to my utilities module right in here. So delay has dry wet control as well as feedback and delay parameter, right? So let's try this with a lot of feedback in a short delay, right? Definitely can ring out. And then as we increase delay time, right, up to uh, about a third of a second, and you can push this a little bit farther with CV. Of course, more interesting timbres are always fun. Right? And this is a Bucket Brigade analog delay, which means you get these smooth transitions. And this does oscillate. As you'd expect. stuff. To complete the tour of Voltage Lab, you have two additional modules, like I mentioned before, that don't have any controls up here, the Sample and Hold module and the Random module. Sample and Hold typically is treated as a random LFO, but it can really do much more. Sorry for the bit of self-promotion here, but there's a whole chapter about Sample and Hold in my book. More on that at the end of this review. Then the Random module is different from Sample and Hold. This is a six-stage random sequencer that flips a coin every step to decide whether it will evolve or not. I won't dive into exactly how it works. Let's just take a listen to it. So I'll patch the CV, say, into the pitch of the primary oscillator over here. Then I'll use gate to trigger dynamics. All right, let's plug this into here. Okay, so you can see it's already doing its thing. Let's maybe try a little less pluck. Okay. So you can see, right? Both the timing of the event and the pitch are random but not totally random. So that's pretty much it. You can play with a few of the probability options by holding shift and modulation destination. You can see these LEDs light up to reflect the different speeds or probabilities. So again, another interesting thing to mess around with within the context of Voltage Lab. Okay, so up until now I've been using a MIDI controller. Let's take a look at the built-in touch controller. Let's just clean things up a little bit here. 
I still want to listen to oscillator one, so let's keep that plugged in. VRL's touch controller is both a playable control surface and a sequencer. It can work in two modes, mono and duo mode, and behaves a bit differently in each, depending on whether you're using it as a playing surface or as a sequencer. You have three sets of outputs, all right and left. Left responds only to the five left touchpads, right responds only to the five right ones, and all responds to both sides, depending on which mode you are in, mono or duo. In mono mode, all just basically reflects whatever the left or right side pads are doing, and in duo mode, all sums up the right and left. As you can see, each set has four outputs, gate, CVA, CVB, and Y-axis. Gate goes high and low whenever you press a touchpad, right? So if I connect this to dynamics, then when I touch a pad, gate goes high. When I leave it, gate goes low. Then CVA and CVB respond to row A and row B of knobs per pad. So I could say, connect CVA to the pitch of the primary oscillator. So for pad one, knob one reflects the voltage level. For pad two, this knob obviously reflects its level. And as I move between the two, the pitch of the oscillator will change. That's what CVA is connected to. Obviously you could connect it to any parameter you like. Same goes for CVB for row B and the Y axis is the Y axis of the pad. Let's connect that say to timbre over here. And now I have Y axis control over timbre. Now, as you may have noticed, these voltage levels are continuous. Right, so they're not set to any particular scale. You've got to use a very good ear or an external quantizing module or external tuner to set these to specific pitches. Now I'm connected currently to the all outputs. If I connected either to the right or left, then when I pressed pads on the opposite side, no change would happen through either of these, right? So if I pressed the right pads and I was connected to the left outputs, it wouldn't do anything. So this is mono mode, right? You can only press one pad at a time. In duo mode, there's a split, right? You've got two active pads. If I wanted to control two oscillators independently, I would use the left and right outputs independently. Since I'm connected through here, remember in duo mode, these two le voltage levels are added. So I could use one side to transpose the other and vice versa, right? Play this note, and this note, you hear the same thing, right? Because the two values are being added. I play this note, right? Both are being transposed and added. Same note, and this, right, again, same note. So the all output adds both sides to one. The transpose effect happens when I say set this here and then play this pattern, then transpose it up, right? Of course, to hear actual notes, you need, like I said, either a quantizer or to tune this. Let's talk about sequencing, works both in mono and duo. So let's say that I wanted to sequence this sequence, right? Just hold mono and press the pads. Nothing's happening, by the way, because I didn't connect clock to the sequencer. So I don't need this anymore. I've got a clock output from here, and I can connect into the step input of the touch controller. Right. Now I'm cycling through the pattern that I programmed. Let's do that again. Right. Say program this pattern. Tap tempo. Slow it down. Or make it faster. Okay, you've got clock divider options. If you hold this, you can also have two sequences running in duo mode, right? So if I go into duo mode, plug in clock, right? So duo mode, right? And then program, let's say one sequence here. Let's go for this, another sequence here. And they work with different clock dividers per side, right? So two sequences at once, or one, because we're going out the all input. In this case, this sequence is transposing this sequence. So nice stuff.
If you like, by the way, you can control the active step with voltage using the scan input. The last little module in VRL is the systems utilities. This is pretty simple. You've got two line outs and a headphone output, two inputs for stereo, right and left. And then this is a DC coupled mixer or adder, which is repeated three times here on the right. Okay, let's summarize and talk about the pros and cons. Obviously, anyone can have their wish list modules that they wish they would have had here. For me, definitely, if there's one module that I wish was included, it's a quantizer. Now, it's easy to connect an external MIDI keyboard or sequencer through the MIDI input, so it's not like notes on the Western scale are completely unavailable here, but it would have been so much nicer just to pass the voltages generated by the touch controller through a scaler. Luckily, though, you can fit a quantizer in here. This is a Eurograc case, so you can replace any one of the three modules. And I think the planning and use of space on Voltage Lab and the touch controller really is to perfection. It would have been nice to see this space utilized for a few more utilities like a quantizer and maybe a DC coupled VCA because the VCAs here are AC coupled. If you want to attenuate voltage levels rather than audio, you can't do that using these VCAs. Another thing you should be aware of that might be hard to see on video, especially if you zoom out to full screen, is that VRL is quite small and tightly packed. It's 48 HP across and there's a lot of functionality in here. Just compare, for example, to maths, this entire module is two envelope generators at about, I think, 20 HP. All that fits into this space here. Now, the fact that things are tight didn't bother me that much. Maybe just these trim pots are a little bit too close to these knobs. And the frequency control knobs, even though they're small and that's good compared to these knobs, don't lean your hand over here. I found myself touching these by mistake and getting out of tune. Aside from those things, it's really nice to have so much in such a compact form. Regarding the case, it has a really nice high-end feel. However, for desktop use, I found that the angle of the top row was a little bit too steep when VRL was placed directly on a desk. I think it needs to be placed slightly higher at eye level or at a bit of an angle to make both rows or both panels visible and accessible. Finally, and I am nitpicking here on the con side, I would have liked to see the looping envelopes go higher than about 75 hertz, and it certainly would have been cool to have a stereo delay here. The output here is stereo and you've got two inputs. The delay here is fantastic. To have two of them would have been awesome. So those are my cons. On the pros side, first and foremost, VRL sounds really great. There are wave shapers all over the oscillator section and with two additional filtering options on two dynamics modules, you won't be left wanting for timbral diversity anytime soon. I also have to say a good word about the design. Now, sure it's compact, but VRL is designed in a way that just makes sense to pack so many components in a 48 HP space and to still maintain an arrangement that's logical and makes sense is no small feat. There are very few hidden features, so it should be fairly easy to reorient yourself when you're ready for a jam session, even if you've been away for a while. The entire package is very easy on the eyes, to say the least, obviously that's a matter of taste. And the fact that it's small means that it's something you can keep handy without coming at the expense of something else in your setup. And if you need any ideas on what to do with so much stuff, check out my book available to people who support this channel on Patreon, which now includes a Eurorack for Beginners section. Feel free to ask me any questions in the comments section below. Hit like if this was useful, and don't forget to ring the bell after subscribing if you don't want to miss the next one. Thanks for watching.